Stokes is with us. And uh, last uh, Monday, David Stokes, St. Louis Show Me Institute policy analyst, is uh, you were here, and, and we just sort of touched on this Olivet Park story because, I don't know, it seemed like a slow news day and it seemed like it was a one-day story. All of a sudden, now this thing has exploded. Once again, the McGraw Millhaven show is in on the early stages of a, a local controversy. Holy mackerel. What's, what's going Hopefully on Hopefully this won't end up like Ellisville. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully the mayor <laughs> still will, will lose Ho- his job. Right. Hopefully this will end in a, in, a, in a happier and shorter time frame. We had the people who were against the park on, uh, and then last week, late last week, we had Jay Williamson on, the former golfer who's, uh, I guess, sort of the public face of this group that wants to bring this uh, development to this uh, park in um, Olivet. Uh, had the meeting go, and, and, and what are your thoughts as you watch this? Well, last week I was able to attend the city council meeting Tuesday night where a lot of residents got up and objected to it. Right. I was not able to attend attend the Thursday night public hearing okay. where the developers made their presentation. I did hear Mr. Williamson on the show Thursday morning. and But I've read the newspaper reports and gotten at least one live account from somebody who was there. And the good news is, is that the developers really are trying to meet people in the middle here mm-hmm. from, from everything I've seen. They've reduced the size of the footprint of the development. They've increased the setbacks. They've guaranteed that a playground will continue. They're trying to do a lot to keep the benefits of this major, major investment in Olivet while trying to reduce the impact on the residents, and they deserve a lot of credit for that. And I hope, I hope it's enough for the city council to move forward on it. There's a couple of different issues here, and uh, one of them being the way we fight City Hall in 2014. We don't just go and say, hmm, what's that? Well, okay. Well, it's these people who decide arbitrarily they don't like it, and then they gin up support and uh, make all these outrageous allegations. And all of a sudden, they whip up everybody into a controversy. And all of a sudden, two people who didn't like this all of a sudden now create this mini controversy because now it looks like it's the town residents against this big bad developer when the facts are much more different than that. Well, that's boy, lo- local government can be so tricky because. It, it really requires getting into the whole detail of details of zoning and planning. And, right. and oftentimes when we discuss these issues, you know, I even get upset about it because I view, you know, you're talking sales from one property owner to another. And, and I don't think there should be a say in that for the outside. But this one's different. This is a city park. This is city owned property. So, yes, the residents of Olivet deserve a say in how this deal is going to go down. This is this is their land. But it's great to see an attempt for the city council, the developers, and and at least some of the, the residents in the group to try and meet in the middle mm-hmm. and try and work out. When I was at the thing Tuesday night, I'll say that most of the speakers at the Tuesday night council meeting that I heard were, were pretty reasonable in their objections. And what I mean by that is they were raising legitimate issues of green space and public ownership of the land. And yes, a few speakers went off the deep end and we're talking about the <laughs> the the health imp- the dangerous health impacts of of artificial turf or, or sport court. So you saw you heard a little bit of silly stuff, but most of it was was serious. And I think I hope the developers and the co- I think the city council's done a good job of putting out widely the, the opportunities for people to comment and get get answers. Right. And it sure seems like the developers are now at least doing a good job of getting their side to the public. And I hope that people realize the size of the investment and the opportunity that these ice rinks and sport court fields, lacrosse fields, and medical rehab center will bring to that to the city is not something you get every day. Here's my question for you, David Stokes. You sat in that chair in this studio and talked about how uh, turning uh, the water company into a private company, right? Turning, uh, getting many of these um, publicly owned u- utilities or sort of right. Uh, get them into private hands and have them run on a private basis. What's so terrible? What's so different about a park that is run by the city now have this park run by a for-profit organization? Well, it really isn't that different. It's there's some legitimate compare, some good comparisons there with the utilities. The private company owns it, but it's heavily regulated right. by the government. And here you have a situation where the city will still own the land, but a private partner is wanting to invest 
private money with no subsidies requested. They're gonna, and I understand they've promised that they're going to pay market rate for this land. The city's still going to own it and have final say in any major changes to the property. So I think it's a good deal. I think with utilities, there's evidence that private utilities operate more efficiently than public utilities. And we don't have a lot of private park examples in Missouri for me to for me to say that. Right. But I do think that when you allow the, the incentives in the private sector to really put together something, compete for people in sports leagues like the Olivet Athletic Association and many others to want to use these facilities because you put together a project in a deal that's so of, of such quality and a reasonable price, I think it's going to be great. And I think it is a good example of the benefits of privatization under within limitation in this case, because this is city owned parkland and the residents do have a legitimate concern about it. But I just hope that we can reach the best of both worlds. And after the meeting Thursday night, I think we're going in that direction. I will say this, that Jay Williamson, who sat in the studio, answered all the questions uh, straight up. Was like, look, we're not trying to hide anything. We'll we, we, we'll change it as much as we can to appease people's concerns of too many lights, too many parking, too much traffic, and so on and so forth. But it is an underutilized park, and people would like to utilize the park more as it is. And so, if you utilize it more, guess what? That means more traffic, more noise, <laughs> more lights, more trash. So it's a park. It's supposed to be used. It is, and it's going to bring a lot of people. Into Mid County, it's going to a lot of people into Olivet. Right. It's going to invest a lot into assets that Mid County is lacking in beyond just Olivet. And I think I think five years from now, the people in that community are going to be delighted that they're around this great asset and right. that there is a nice playground that their kids can use. But it, it's also and the fields that they can use. It's also that the government you get the government from the people who show up, right? Because I think if you were to seriously sit down and talk to the people of Olivet and the area. And the quarter, they'd be like, oh, my goodness, this is a great idea. Well, why aren't you at the meeting? Well, I got kids. I got a family. I got to cook. I got to clean. I got to do this. I got to do that. I'm working a second job and so on and so forth. Right? People don't have time to go to the city hall meetings and look at this and whatever else. They don't have time to vote. They don't have time to this. So guess what? The people who complain, the people who have nothing to do, those are the people who get heard. Those are the people whose uh, voices get heard more than everybody else's. Absolutely. Although in this case, I think the people showing in opposition have some legitimate points to make, as opposed to, I think, in I don't want to say the points in the Clayton development of the Maryland school are, are illegitimate, but, but that's a private business transaction, the school district right. to, to private developers. So I think that that's, that that's a, their, their objections in Clayton are, should be, should be, people should step back and say, you know what? This is a private, the be, people who benefit, and I apologize, I'm misspeaking here. The people who benefit are going to be region wide, lower tax rate, a wider tax base for everybody. Here in Olivet, I do think you have a case where the residents, they're losing some green space, and it's up to the developers in the city to demonstrate why this is going to benefit them in the long run. I think they have, I think they're starting to, but I really want to emphasize that this isn't a case like Brentwood or Maryland Heights where I just think the objections are totally way off base. I, I do want to think that the people there have some legitimate concerns. I don't say that a lot from a zoning no, perspective. No, this is new for you. Right. This is new. <laughs> but I, I, the developers seem to be trying to address it, and I, th I think that's terrific. Because I think in the long run, this would be an, off, an awesome development for the community. Where are we with Lyft and Uber? You're following that relatively closely. Anything new with that? Well, the, the courts have have ruled against Lyft in St. Louis temporarily, and I, I think they've, they've had their second hearing, and I don't think that ruling has, has come down yet. Right. I, I, I could be wrong on that. It could have happened recently, and I missed it while focusing on, right. on Olivet here. But what we're doing, I'll tell you this, we're harming the, every day that we go where Lyft and Uber aren't operating in St. Louis is harming the transportation options yes. of people who want better and more variety of taxi cab service in St. Louis City, and I say St. Louis City, it applies to St. Louis County just as well. Mm -hmm. For people who want to live without a car, bike or use public transit, but you know a couple times a week really need that car, you, they should be able to call Uber up or call Lyft up in two minutes and get that. It's 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 really interesting because uh, people argue about the transportation part of this. The you have a highly regulated um, taxi cab commission or a taxi cab industry, right? And so technology is bringing this new, unregulated world to this. And so people are freaking out over it. But you know what? 
it's happening everywhere where the internet and the phone and the smartphone is bringing a whole new world to a highly regulated area. And, for example, over the weekend I was reading the story that um, casinos are fighting tooth and nail to keep internet gambling off of the internet. Why should internet gambling be illegal? <laughs> right? I mean, what, what, what? If, I can, if I can take, you know, if you can drive me, through Lyft, why can't I gamble through my smartphone? Well, I think you should be able to. Right. And we're seeing examples all over all over the world, probably, where where people are trying to use the law to prevent technological change. Right. And that's what's inappropriate, be it Tesla or Lyft or Uber. I haven't worked too much in the casino gambling industry right. online. But, but it's clearly these casinos don't want the gambling coming in. It's these restaurants uh, that don't want the food trucks coming in. It's, you know, everyone who's got their existing business want to use whatever they can to keep out the competition from this new tech technology. And lawyers don't want paralegals to be able to help people fill out contracts. Right. And, and doctors don't want nurses to be able to have larger clinics in rural Missouri to, to serve people on, right. a, on a cash basis. Yeah. So you have hundreds of examples of this, and we have a lot of information on it at showmeinstitute.org on the abuse of of the use of licensing under the guise of safety to limit competition. What we've seen in the past couple of years is a new type of, of example with mobile phone apps is they're really upsetting the Apple cart. Right. And Lyft and Uber are just, they're not the only example, they're sort of the best example because it's what everybody can right. understand and wrap their head around really fast. Right, it, but, but it's happening everywhere. All over the place. It, 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 it would be like if KTRS and all the TV and radio stations got together and said, you can't have an internet radio station because you're not regulated. And, oh, my goodness, you might say a bad word on there. Right? I mean, we have no right to say you can't start a radio station on the internet. And it's so great as somebody who's been writing about the harms of licensing <laughs> in these for years that, that people are now getting interested. in. There was an op-ed in the New York Times last week on, on the harms of licensing and all these different occupations that now – have to be licensed. And, and one of the good news is in the legislature the past several years, you've seen a slowdown in the growth of these, of these limits. The Tesla one got a lot of press this year, right. but it didn't actually pass. Right. Thank goodness, and I, I hope it never passes. Right. There, but, should be, there should be no law preventing me from leaving this studio in a, in a minute and, and calling a Tesla, calling, I'm sorry, calling an Uber or a Lyft car to take me down to the office if that's what I want to do. These regulations are... Under the guise of safety, they're totally there to do nothing more than limit competition to the existing cab company. That's David Stokes, ladies and gentlemen. He's a Show Me Institute policy analyst, and, and if I had my way, I would regulate you out of business, these smartphones out there. It's outrageous. I can get the, all this on the Internet. I don't need to listen to you on the radio. Um, where can we read you? When can we see you, David Stokes? Thanks, McGraw. Thanks, Kelly. So much information on, on licensing and zoning issues that we've talked about today at showmeinstitute.org. ShowMeDaily.org is our, our daily blog, and people can follow me on Twitter at David C. Stokes. 850, Big 550, KTRS. This is